One of the things that Morningstar is most famous for is ratings. So we take the huge breadth and depth of data that we have around you know, the performance of investment products. So that's things like funds, equities or stocks, etc. Uh, and we produce ratings and analysis uh, and opinion based on that data. So at the core level, you have that data, that raw data, performance of, a, of an investment, management history, et cetera, et cetera, how it compares to a benchmark or a category. Then on top of that, we have our ratings, which are both backward looking and forward looking, depending on which one you're looking at. So the forward looking one, for example, is our, whether we think that fund or that investment product will outperform its peers or its benchmarks over a forward looking period. And that's packaged up into different data deliveries, different software deliveries, different tools that help investors make decisions and basically ultimately decide where and how they want to invest their hard-earned money. You mentioned you enjoy working at Morningstar. What is it you like about being there and how entrepreneurial do you think they are? Uh, culturally, the, the best place I've ever worked. I think that mission to empower investor success really does resonate. It kind of shines through and it is the North Star of everything that we do. And it's absolutely very entrepreneurial. It's, it's something we're really encouraged to do. And I guess that manifests itself in being able to make technology decisions at quite a, a micro level. Obviously we have guardrails and suggestions and patterns and best practices, uh, but ultimately teams are responsible for making their own choices, um, picking the technology that they want to use and, and, and sort of going ahead and delivering. So what does your IT estate look like? Is it mostly on premises? What database choices have you made? Talk us through, through your stack a little bit. So Morningstar will be 40 years old in 2024. Given the, the age, obviously there's a huge on-premise footprint. My boss has given us a very clear mandate that we are to be out of on-premise data centers by 2025. And, and there'll be some niche exceptions to that, I'm sure, some, you know, a few racks here and there for particular use cases, but the mandate is out by 2025. So part of that's been driven by compelling events. So we had a data center in Europe that was going to require significant capex to upgrade end of life firewalls and network equipment. So rather than lose money in, uh, in terms of investing in that and then not seeing an amortized return, we used that as a, a kind of a kickstart to, to migrate that data center and the workloads within it to cloud. How, how much have you moved into the cloud thus far? Uh, it'd be hard to give a percentage, certainly in terms of major data centers. I think we probably had seven and we're now down to four okay. on-prem, so roughly halfway. So I think with a lot of the products, we've taken a, a sort of lift and shift approach to the extent that we're not changing necessarily huge amounts of software, but we're certainly going and using Terraform or, or infrastructure as code. So, so kind of modernizing or, or cloudifying the processes, maybe more than the software. And then over time, iterating and breaking down monoliths, deploying serverless where we can for, for efficiencies and scale. Okay. Um, and Mongo has been very much on that journey with us. We started using Mongo self-managed, hosted, on-prem, running Linux. And as that product has migrated to the cloud, it's then there'd been an opportunity to onboard Atlas. And so we've gone from a self-managed community edition Mongo to a sort of hybrid where we had some Atlas, some community on-prem, and now fully multi-region Atlas. How's that been for you? Very straightforward, I have to say. We like Atlas. We think it's a good product. Very easy to deploy. It's great not to have to run infrastructure and yep. all the headaches and expense that comes with that. Yep. Uh, we find the support really good, not just in a break fix way, but for functionality questions and syntax and how should we model and design and deploy this. Um, so it's been a very straightforward exercise and that's led to other opportunities as we become advocates for Mongo, for Atlas in particular. Other uh, teams within the organization have come to us and asked for advice and pointers and have subsequently onboarded Mongo as well. So it's kind of growing organically, the footprint, um, but that wouldn't be the case if it wasn't, if people weren't having a good experience. Over time, it became clear that uh, we were still investing a lot of time in one-off implementations, one-off design work, which doesn't scale for us. And equally, more and more clients were coming to us just wanting the APIs. So that business has now pivoted to be a purely API business. Basically, it's a kind of window into our data, our research, our calculations, uh, just all the kind of power and strength of Morningstar. But specifically designed for use cases or workloads where clients want to plug straight into their own digital experiences. Okay. So for example, let's say I'm a, a fund platform in the UK. You power a screening 
uh, use case or workload with an API where I can go on, I can filter screen for investments that I'm interested, maybe with particular performance, particular rating. I can then click through and, and see the portfolio construction of that investment. Again, that would be powered by directly by an API of ours. So um, it means there's not, you know, the client doesn't have to have a, a large database infrastructure at their end. They can plug these APIs right into their front end. So MongoDB in, uh, for that product is the data source. So I, as you can imagine, Morningstar has a fairly broad and, and disparate series of core databases. So where Mongo fits in that picture is where pulling data or collating, aggregating data from those backend sources into a product level database, which is Mongo, optimize data models for different use cases, for, for the screening and the searching, for example, would be one. Another one is this an optimized model just for fast recall and presenting to the customer. So it, it's where we hold all our investment data for that product. My role spans uh, any technologist that exists within or that lives within the EMEA region. So it's product focused folks and teams delivering products like the ones that we've talked about. It's network infrastructure, it's office infrastructure, modernizing our AV experience for our users. Cloud migration continues apace. Lots going on. Lots going on. Yeah, it keeps me certainly, keeps me busy, a good busy. You must have seen, you know, the technology world evolve immensely since the late 90s. About half. Particularly in the investment banking space, you know, what are some of the standout changes that you think that's driven, maybe over the last five years or so? I mean, I think in, in, in banking, what you see is these disruptive organizations coming online and being able to do things much more agile with a sort of small A, yeah. much more quickly. The, the thing that stymied innovation in banks was always the bureaucracy in the, in the nicest sense of the word, you know, change control boards, legacy technologies, big mainframes, which is understandable and it changes hard in a regulated environment as well. You know, if an investment bank makes a big mistake, as we've seen, it's front page news for potentially weeks on end. But I think banks generally recognize that now and they've either they launch labs or they, they have subsets of the organization that are designed to drive um, entrepreneurialism, uh, innovation. Um, so that I think they are catching up in that regard.